So what I wanted to focus on today was expand or frame shifting. Okay, so there are tips that can enhance our ability across all five, and what I want to talk, together, talk about now is expanding. How do we expand our possible option sent? How do we see options that others don't see? How do strategists see possible strategies others don't see? Well, we can learn a lot by studying Alexandra Kustinuk, and that's where the name came from in the previous slide. So here we see Alexandra Kustinuk, the reigning women's world chess champion. And she's playing a whole series of games. What does that look like? 20 or 30? She stands in front of one board, and she sees the big idea, the winning move. She stands in front of the next, she sees the winning move. She stands in front of the next, she sees the winning move. She makes it to the end, and then she repeats. She's going to win all of these games. And this person over there, he's going to be staring at his board for 30 minutes as she makes her way around. And he's going to be thinking, what's Alexandra going to do next? And he's not going to see it. And within seconds, she's going to look at the board, and she's going to see it. And she's going to surprise him. How is it that great strategists can look at a problem and see the winning move, while the rest of us struggle? Well, the good news is that it has nothing to do with our innate intelligence. It is simply to do with that great strategists overcome a mathematical barrier. Humans can only remember seven plus or minus two things at once. Our short-term working memory capacity, our RAM of our computer, is seven plus or minus two. That's why when you go to the grocery store and you have to buy 10 things, you don't write down a list, you always come back and you've forgotten something, right? That's why when you give a presentation, you want to make it five points, not more than nine points, because people can't remember that. That's why phone numbers have seven digits. And when you're playing a game that has more than seven possible options, what your computer does is it stops showing you options. And so the reason that strategists are able to see that winning move is because they're not considering just seven. They're considering 30, 40, 50 possible options. And they're doing it intuitively right there. They overcome this barrier. They overcome it by performing a certain mental trick. To illustrate this mental trick, I'm going to ask you to remember the last four digits of my cell phone number. 3305. Don't write that number down. Just remember that number. 3305. How many people remember that number right now? Good. Most of us. Good. So this is the badly model of short-term working memory. And what it says is the way that a human retains something in short-term working memory is for one of three processes. The first is that we might use our phonetic loop. This model says that about half of us are saying to ourselves, 3305, 3305, 3305. How many people do you hear yourself doing that? <laughs> exactly. Close to half of us, third of us. Great. The other way is that we may be using our visuospatial sketch pad, which is that we're visualizing a number, maybe the numerals or the shape they would make in a keypad. How many people do you hear you see yourself doing that? OK, close to the other half of us. Anyone willing to share with us who didn't raise your hand on either of those would be willing to share with us what you're doing? It might be the third one. Anyone willing to share with us how you're remembering this number? Yes, just yell it out. 33 and 05. Great. So you're chunk them together as two things, so you're only remembering two rather than four, right? Great, great. So he's starting to point at this third way. Let me give you another number to describe this third way. Um, 2468. Don't write that number down. Just remember that number. Okay? How many people remember that number? How many people have seen this sequence before? How many people have an idea what the next number would be? Probably 10, right? Like I could trick you and say it was 100, but you know, probably 10. You could unpack that number, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. You could unpack that number all the way to 2 million and 4, 2 million and 6. It's a sequence that you've seen before. When you pull up one piece of information from your long-term memory, that information tells you what the next piece of information that you should search for. And you can keep unpacking it. It's a narrative. It's a story. And when Alexandra is playing her games, she's using that. She looks at the game and she says, ah, I recognize this game. I've played this game before. And what comes next is 10 and then 12. While the rest of us are looking at our pawns and trying to figure out how to put all the pieces together, she's just repeating stories to herself. 
And the reason that she can see options that we can't see is simply that she comes at the game with more stories. And this has actually been measured, that master chess players recognize twice as many patterns as experts, and grandmasters recognize 10 times as many. Your ability to see a strategic option that others don't see is simply a function of the number and diversity of strategic narratives that you bring to the game. Now, these strategic narratives are ingrained in us from a very young age. Different cultures have different narratives. You know, I'm telling my children a lot of fairy tales now about Cinderella and, and Sleeping Beauty. These embed narratives at a very young age. We've all heard the story of the Trojan horse, right? You've probably used that analogy in business, our Trojan horse strategy, our Trojan horse product, right? It is, describes a very complex sequence of moves and counter moves. But because we've seen it before, we can describe it in just a couple words, two words, Trojan horse. It unpacks the narrative. What I've been working with since two, two, sorry, 2004 is, um, when, when I published my first book, is based off the 36 stratagems. This is a Chinese collection of narratives that is the product of about 1,000 years of oral tradition. And around 500 AD, someone wrote it down. We don't know who. Someone wrote down this list of 36 stratagems. And, and in the book that you'll get, it lists all 36 with descriptions and, and examples and questions. Now, I believe that this set of 36 metaphors or narratives is much more than just a flowery, set of flowery phrases. I believe that they are a complete vocabulary for describing competitive interaction. The reason is that I studied lots of companies. I took 9,000 publicly traded companies and looked for the ones that for 10 years grew faster, generated more profit margin, and generated more shareholder value than their competition. So profit is cumulative average, sorry, revenue growth is cumulative average growth rate of revenue. Profit margin is EBITDA, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, cash flow, profit margin and total return to shareholder. Look for the 100 companies that consistently for 10 years outperformed their competitors across all three. How many of you would like your company for the next 10 years to grow faster, generate more shareholder value, and uh, be more profitable than your competitors for the next 10 years? It'd be great, right? So what I did was I looked at what patterns did they use to engineer that breakthrough growth, and I took the 100 companies, and I classified what they did according to the 36 stratagems. And so now you can take this database, now it's about 400 long. You can take this database and say in different situations, what strategies work, what strategies don't, and importantly, in what eras, what strat some strategies work, some strategies don't. And so I ran this analysis originally about five years ago, and then I ran it again um, recently for my new book because I found that the companies that are winning today aren't on this list anymore. Something's changed. And so I ran the list off of companies that are performing really well now, that have performed, outperformed their competition the last five years. And if we look at what narratives they use, we start seeing a new playbook emerge. They're using a different set of narratives than their predecessors. And that's the new playbook. So of the 36, you know, we don't have time to go through all 36. Even if we had three days, I'd bore you to death by going through all 36. You know, in the next 20 minutes, what would be the right five of these 36 to go through. Obviously, I think, the ones that represent the new paradigm, the new playbook, because that's what we want to adopt. So the new playbook of these 36, these are the five stratagems that distinguish winners from losers today. Move early to the next battleground, coordinate the uncoordinated, force a two-front battle, be good, create something out of nothing. This is kind of like the fingerprint of the outthinker. And if you look at your problem, your challenge, your growth challenge through these five lenses, just like Alexandra comes at it with a different set of narratives, you look at it through these five narratives, I believe that you'll see new strategic options that you might not otherwise see. You're also going to recognize yourself because you are an outthinker. You are at the cutting edge, and you're starting to adopt this new paradigm already. And you probably work with some old clients who are stuck in old ways, and you'll start seeing that this, show, this describes why you think differently than they do. Okay? So what I invite you to do is to look for your, one of your big ideas today, in the next 20 minutes, 
And I let you to take out a piece of paper and start writing ideas down for yourself as I describe these, 30, these, these five. Typically when I do this, um, you know, I do this for a lot of technology companies, for Microsoft, Symantec, Corbis, um, GE Healthcare, um, and a lot of other smaller companies. And what we do is apply these to generate new growth strategies for our business, for the business, and typically we generate 40, 50 to 150 ideas. Um, so let's take the opportunity to do a little bit of brainstorming for your business and see how can you apply these to your business. So I invite you to take out a piece of paper and start writing out ideas as I describe each of these. So the first pattern is to move early to the next battleground. Sun Tzu, the ancient Chinese general, says, he who is first to battle is at ease, he who is late to battle is at labor. Thus the wise general summons others and is not summoned by them. The idea is that your competitors are focusing on today's battleground. And what you do is you lift up your head and you start playing already for the next battleground. The reason that this is particularly important today is because our cycle times, the cycles, the times between disruption are shortening. And so the game is no longer win today because that positions us to win tomorrow. You already have to be playing for tomorrow. You, it's about winning the transitions between battleground shifts. Another more modern strategist was asked, how come you're such a great hockey player? And Wayne Gretzky said, well, it's simple, because I skate to where the puck is going, not to where the puck is. Same principle. That's what we're talking about. It's like, just take, your heads, take your eyes away from the puck and look for where is the puck going. One company I got a chance to interview a few times is called Rosetta Stone. How many people here use Rosetta Stone? Has anyone used Rosetta Stone? Someone get, I, won't, I won't call on you if you don't want me to call on you. Okay, all right, someone get us That's great. Um, so Rosetta Stone has really come out of nowhere and become the leading language learning offering um, in about five years. And I interviewed the CEO and asked him to describe his strategy, and he described perfectly this next battleground strategy. What he said was, when I took over the company in 2005, we were playing on today's battleground. Today's battleground is using technology to replace the classroom experience of learning a language. Sir, would you mind telling me your name that, in, in the red shirt? that? What's your name? Scott? Right. So just telling Scott, hey, Scott, don't sign up for that class. Do you mind telling me what you were learning? Uh, German. German. Don't sign up to that class, for you know, the German class. Instead, buy this software. And, and they were competing in a crowded battlefield with a bunch of other current Battlegrounds um, offerings, other $30 DVDs and tapes and books, right? The new Battleground is using technology to replace the classroom experience of learning a language. So telling Scott, hey, you don't have to move to Germany for six months. Instead, you can take this offering. So I'd like you to imagine that future with me. Hold your head there. And let's look at how we would have to adopt our strategy to start moving early to that next battleground. The first thing, let's look at pricing. Currently, we price at $300, I mean, sorry, $30. Does our price go up or down to move into the new future? How many people say up? How many people say down? OK, all right. Um, the price goes up, because there are three ways to price. We can price based on cost. You can price based on competition. You can price based on value. And if we move to the next battleground, we're not going to have competition, so we can price based on value. Basically, we can tell Scott, hey, don't spend $20,000 to move to Germany for six months. Just buy this product. So they raise their price from $30 to $300. Now this creates a distribution challenge. Because no one's going to go into a bookstore and pull down a $300 box and then go and check out. They have to talk to someone. right? So what they do is, you know, radic now you know, but it was radical at the time, was they start opening kiosks in books, I mean, sorry, in airports and in malls. You know, at the time, the only thing you could buy in kiosks were, you know, cheap sunglasses and Israeli sea salts, right? Now you're selling $300 software. It was radical and was disruptive. Another thing on the product, one thing we're going to do is we're not going to teach Scott how to conjugate verbs anymore. Because when he goes to 
check out at a grocery store in Germany, he's not going to have anyone there saying, no, it's ich kaufe, du kaufst, sie kaufen, wir kaufen. Yeah? They're going to say, they're just going to figure it out. Right? They're, just, they're going to react or understand them or not. So we're not going to teach people how to conjugate verbs. In fact, we are not even going to have any English in Scott's product. Does anyone see the other strategic advantage of having no English in Scott's product? Who sees, a, who sees the other advantage? Yeah, what, what is it? Doesn't matter the native language. So our competitors, when they create the German product, they're going to have to create the German, French product, German, English, German, Spanish, German, Chinese, and we have to produce one SKU. So our inventory costs go down, and you know, everything's simplified, right? So that's, a, that's the third thing to do. And then the fourth thing he says is, we adjusted our people strategy. We don't hire language experts anymore. We don't hire people who would come from the mindset of teaching Scott how to conjugate verbs. Instead, we hire people who have learned a second language naturally. You can dissect every great disruptive company and see those big ideas across their business. And they create lots of reasons for competition not to copy you. One of the frameworks that you'll see in the book is this framework is eight Ps. And what it says is that you want to distinguish yourself across eight different dimensions if you can. Product, price, place, promotion. How many people have heard of that? It's a very commonly known marketing term. Now, what if we could also add to that positioning, processes, physical experience, and people? And if we look at great companies, they have big ideas, winning moves across lots of these, and they create lots of reasons for competition not to copy. So just like Urban Outfitters, Rosetta Stone says, hey, copy my strategy. All you have to do is redesign your product, increase your price to $300, open up a new sales channel, fire all your managers, and hire new managers. They raise the copying cost. So a very important question that you want to ask yourself right now is, where is the next battleground? And what can I do now to start preparing for that next battleground? I invite you to write down at least two ideas that come to that, come from that. What, what are the key technological trends, the social shifts, the geographies, the buying patterns, the needs that you want to do something today to start preparing for tomorrow? OK, the next pattern is coordinate the uncoordinated. This plays on the fact that the old paradigm was the way that you create power was by coordinating things, but the way you coordinated things you, was that you buy them and you coordinate them inside your walls. And the new paradigm is you can coordinate things outside of your walls. Power comes from coordination. I'm going to go through the next three pretty quickly. This is why birds fly in flocks, why fish swim in schools, and why animals travel in herds. They create power by coordinating themselves. That's how we create power. And the way we coordinate things now is changed. This is why Wikipedia has kicked Microsoft out of the encyclopedia business. Encyclopedia and Carta used to be the biggest and most popular encyclopedia people. How many, how many people use Encyclopedia and Carta? How many people use Wikipedia? So you see the numbers there. Microsoft announced two years ago that it was just going to cancel the Encarta program, get out of the business, because what they said is Wikipedia has adopted a superior model, which is coordinating independent experts rather than hiring people to write proprietary content for us. They recognize that. Facebook, LinkedIn, they all make it easier for us to coordinate people. Zagatz was maybe the original coordinator. They had restaurant visitors writing the guides. You know, Google bought them. I'm sure you know that. Um, so you go to some McDonald's now in the United States. You drive up. You order a Big Mac, large fries, Diet Coke. That order is being taken by a stay-at-home mom who's working from her home computer. She types in your order. It's sent to the store. And by the time you turn the corner, your food's waiting for you. McDonald's beta testing this. But what they're finding is not only is this lower cost, but also there are fewer order accuracies because this person's not trying to do three things at once. Coordinating the uncoordinated, finding a population, stay at mothers who want a second job and want to work from home, and coordinating them. In San Francisco, two guys got together for coffee, and they sat down and they talked about what you always talk about in San Francisco is 
how difficult it is to find parking. He said, we've been circling this coffee shop for an hour, and we couldn't find a parking spot, and yet there are all these driveways that are empty. This is inefficient use of real estate. So they found a way to coordinate that real estate. And now if you are living in San Francisco and you have a driveway that you're not going to use between 9 and 5, you can register it on Park Circa, say how much you want to rent it for, and if I want to rent it, I can go online, find it, and pay for it online, and use it. It's amazing what you can coordinate these days. So you want to look at, are you fully using that to your advantage? Combine and coordinate independent elements within your environment to orchestrate much greater power. Who could we coordinate? That's the second question to ask. Who could we coordinate? Let's try to write down at least one idea there. Even if it's an outrageous, crazy idea, that's how the ideas begin. So the third play in this playbook is force a two-front battle. Force a two-front battle. And what we're seeing is that companies are no longer defining themselves by an industry. Instead, they're defining themselves by something else, and that allows them to cut across industries. So I run this group of um, strategy executives in New York, and we meet every two or three months. And the rule is that you're not going to sit across the table from a direct competitor. Unfortunately, one of our members left AOL, and they went to Google. And then once she went to Google, my, my Microsoft member obviously said, well, she's a direct competitor. I don't want her at the table. And then my Nokia executive said, well, they compete with me in phones, so I don't want to you know, have her there. And then my MasterCard member said, well, they compete with us in payments, so I don't want to be there. It's like Google competes with everybody but they're focused. The way you reconcile that focus and cutting across industry bounds is to say that Google does not define itself by its industry, it defines itself by something else, and that thing it can project into new industries. Good example of this is Autodesk. Autodesk is uh, the maker of AutoCAD. How many people here have used AutoCAD? See that sense? Yeah. So AutoCAD's the leading software for describing 3D environments, right? Um, for used mostly by architects and engineers. And when they looked for growth opportunities, they didn't say, hey, where else could we expand in, expand in the, engineering, um, the engineering architecture field? They said, what are we really good at? Well, we're really good at helping people describe 3D environments digitally. Where else could we apply that? Ah. Well, we could apply that into film animation. So they launched a product called Maya. And you know, in the last 10 years, every film that's been nominated for an Oscar in, dig in film animation uses Maya software. They're much more expensive. They probably have something like a 60 70% market share now. So this is the principle. You find something that you're really good at, and you push it. You project it into another industry. And since we're in a, a cloud conference, I want to give you one example of an interesting cloud company that I came across called MadePro. MadePro looks like it is a made um, franchise, a made service franchise. So if you want to say you want to quit your job and you want to do something different, right? you might decide you want to open up a made service company. And you will subscribe for a um, you know, for, for a made service franchise from MadePro. And they'll give you all the marketing and everything. And they'll give you access to this software that allows you to do you know, the, you know, the, the invoicing and the tracking and the pricing and everything. Their whole play is creating a software for field sales management. And they view themselves as a software company, not a made service company. So you could say that they took their core capability and they figured out, let me project it into made service. That's a way to force a two-front battle. So you want to ask yourself, what competitors or customers can we surprise by crossing industry lines? What are we really good at, and how can we surprise the competition by projecting that into a seemingly unrelated industry and actually be something different? Okay. So write down any idea that comes from that.
Now, the fourth strategy is to be good. The old paradigm of business was that companies existed to serve shareholders. When I was in business school, that's what I was taught. If you just focus on maximizing shareholder value, everything somehow works out. Cheat your customers just enough so you get value for shareholders. But the paradigm is shifting. You know, Walmart realized that this paradigm wasn't working for it and went through a tremendous redesign of its business strategy in order to adopt the new paradigm, which says that you want to serve multiple shareholders. You want to serve the community, serve employees, serve the country, serve the environment. The more stakeholders that you are good for, the more pull you create for your company, the less competition you create. There's strategic value in being good. A good example of this is a company called Best Doctors. Best Doctors was created by a doctor in Venezuela. He moved up to Boston, and he started, uh, started a practice after going to Harvard uh, Medical School. And one of his patients from a long time ago flew up from Venezuela to Boston because he wanted a second opinion. He was diagnosed with something back home, and he, what, he questioned the diagnosis. So he came up to his friend and got a second diagnosis, and the doctor said, you know what? Your doctor was right. Unfortunately, you had to fly all the way up here to find out that your diagnosis was a correct diagnosis. It's a shame you had to spend that much money. And think about how many people want a second diagnosis, deserve, need a second diagnosis, but they can't afford to get it. We need to do something about that. So we created a company called Best Doctors. And it's a process, a service, to help people get second um, opinions. And they're doing amazing things. For example, there's a woman, she was losing her eyesight. And she was diagnosed with brain cancer. She's scheduling her appointment for the operation. And they're going to cut open her head and carve out this tumor. But her employee, employer was a Best Doctors customer. So she can call the 800 number, and she can go through the Best Doctors process. They've got this really interesting um, sequence process, at the end of which there is a Best Doctor, and a specialist, who says, you know what? she may not have brain cancer. It may be this condition that usually infects, uh, um, affects the muscle tissue, but sometimes it affects the brain. If you give her these pills, let's see if it goes away. So they give her these pills, and you know what? She can see. She almost had her head opened up. That is what Best Doctors is doing. By the way, they also happen to be $120 million in revenue, growing 30% a year, 40% gross margins, extremely profitable business. What we're seeing is the emergence of this third type of enterprise, the social enterprise, that is after a social cause, but that also is profitable. One more f interesting company that, um, that I've come across. My cousin from Germany, she moved to New York to work for this startup. She turned down a bunch of big jobs because she wanted to work for this little startup called Holsti. And they have created this manifesto. This manifesto has now been tweeted millions of times and retweeted millions of times. And it is, um, you know, it's, 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 it's growing their revenues incredibly. And this is what they stand for. This is your life. Do what you love and do it often. If you don't like something, change it. If you don't like your job, quit. If you don't have enough time, stop watching TV. If you are looking for the love of your life, stop. They'll be waiting for you when you start doing things you love. Right? So again, we're seeing that the companies that are winning today are pursuing something bigger, something that people want to be part of, bigger than shareholder value. And there's strategic value in you doing that. So ask yourself, what is it that you're going to do? How can you gain strategic power by benefiting key stakeholders? that you are not considering now? What would it mean like for your company to actually be a social cause? Finally, we have create something out of nothing. This plays on the fact that your competitors are playing with you following a rule that doesn't exist. And they're playing with you because this rule exists in other games. The rule says you can't add a new piece to the board. Like when I'm playing chess with you, I can't take a queen out of my back pocket and put it next to your king, right? It can't add a new player to the football field. Right? You have to play with the pieces on the board. But there's a different type of game. For example, Go, which is a Japanese and Chinese strategy game. And there, the rules are the opposite. You can't move the pieces on the board. You can only add and remove pieces. 
So what this strategy encourages you to do is to think about playing the game that you're playing following these rules. You can't play with the pieces that are there. You can only add or remove pieces. If you take that perspective, you'll see things, new things. So I was doing a workshop at Microsoft um, a few weeks before Apple launched his iPad. And we were doing a two-day strategy workshop, and we were chose as a case, how should Microsoft respond to the iPad? Right? I'm not sharing anything that's confidential. These people wouldn't have been involved at all in you know, Microsoft's response. These were engineers from other parts of the business. This is just a fun case to work on. But the conclusion at the end of the whole session was, hey, there's nothing for Microsoft to do. The iPad is a tablet PC. Tablet PCs have been around for a long time. Their market share is small, growing slowly, and we already have a, we already have a tablet solution. There's nothing to do. But what they missed is, and I think this is one of the key distinguishing factors of Apple, is that Apple adds new pieces to the board. They create categories. They don't create an MP3 player, they create an iPod. They don't create a tablet, they, take a, they create an iPad. And if we see how they squeeze growth out of their business, we see they keep adding new categories. New categories. So what new category could you create? And as a final example of, of, of business example, I'd like you to look at um, the Big Bertha in Callaway Golf. How many people are familiar with the, with the Big Bertha case? Because it's become fairly well. All right, so I'll do a shortened version of this. Um, because it's been popularized in a book called uh, Blue Ocean Strategy. So Eli Calloway, he's an entrepreneur. Um, he, well, he becomes an entrepreneur in, in, at age 55. He buys a winery in California. And he's selling wine. One day, the Queen of England comes to the United States, and she's at a big estate dinner, and she orders a second glass of wine. The next day, all the newspapers in the US and the UK read, the Queen asks for a second glass of wine. Apparently, this is a big deal. Queens are not supposed to ask for second glass of wine. So everyone wants to know, what is this wine that is so good that the Queen of England breaks protocol to ask for it, and it's his wine? And his sales start climbing through the roof, his prices go up, and at age 62, I believe, he sells his winery for $15 million. So what are you going to do at age 62 with $15 million? Probably retire, right? Hit the golf course, right? So he decides he's going to go at it again. He's going to start a new business, and the business is Callaway Golf. And his insight is this, that there are millions of people who are afraid to play golf because they're afraid to pick up the driver. The driver is the first club you use, and they're so poorly designed at the time that even good golfers can't um, direct the ball accurately. So he finds a way for them to cheat, and he creates the Big Bertha. The Big Bertha is so good that even novice golfers like me can swing and the ball goes exactly where, where, where I want it to go. It's so good that the PGA says, this is illegal. You're not allowed to use this on PGA tours. And what does he say? I don't care. Because I'm not selling this to golfers. I'm selling this to the millions of people who are standing off on the side and they're afraid to step up. They're afraid to play golf, right? because they're afraid to pick up a driver. That's the concept here. You're going to add a new player to the game, a new customer. You're going to add a new occasion, a new category. What can you add to the board that can create an advantage and surprise your comp competition? Try to come up with one thing. I got hundreds of examples, you know, which we won't go through. So. Can you add a new category, new occasion, new customer, new supplier, new dis dis distributor, new regulations? What could you add to the board to create an advantage for yourself? So that's the playbook. So what I said was, the way you beat your competition is by outthinking the competition. Outthinking the competition is seeing a strategic option that your competitors won't respond effectively to. To do that effectively, you want to adopt five habits. You can remember those five habits, you're remembering ideas. Imagine, dissect, expand, analyze, sell. If you adopt those five habits every day, I believe that every day you'll see new strategic options that competitors won't respond um, effectively to. If you remember just one thing from today, what I would hope it would be is this playbook, is that the next time you go into a client meeting, a sales meeting, or uh, an operating meeting, you're going to ask these five questions. 
Where is the next battleground? Who could we coordinate? How can we project our capability into a new sector? How can we be good? And what can we create? If you ask these five questions, I believe that every day you'll see 10 options that you wouldn't otherwise see and start outthinking the competition. This is my website. Um, as uh, Will mentioned, I, I, I write a blog for Fast Company, and um, I've got a bunch of free stuff there, free tools. If you like this concept of outthinking the competition, if you like what we covered, I'd love to stay in touch with you. Uh, thank you for your time.